see myself every morning in the mirror. You could even face that. I know. If you saw me in the mirror first, and I was like, Dad, actually, Christmas you have Christmas morning, you wake up, he rolls out of bed. We have to open presents now, don't we? I have a t-shirt that says, <laughs> Night of the Living Dad. <laughs> Christmas morning. Brains. It just means I actually get to sit next to you for once, so I can monitor the camera. Hush up. Don't make me come back there. <laughs> All right. Okay. Hello, Rowling. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Not that people don't know you. Uh, hi there. Uh, my name is Mike Pondsmith, and I'm the guy who killed your cyberpunk character. <laughs> okay, so we're here to talk cyberpunk, among other things. I'll let you guys ask questions. And throw, actually, no throwing things at me. I'm in a bad mood today, and I can't dodge. No, no, no. Back off. I, I do not need nose hairs. <laughs> I didn't have a chance to shave today, okay? <laughs> I did have a chance to refresh the uh, green stripe on my hair, so I feel like I'm dressed. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk a bit about Cyberpunk, what we're doing. Um, how many of you guys here know anything about the Cyberpunk game? Okay, so I don't start at zero. Good. Yeah, we do this game. It's called Cyberpunk. It, like, will you stop no, no, no. doing stuff? Just keep talking. It's recording. Ignore me. I'm the camera person. Uh, I've been trying to ignore you for months, but it's not working. You married my son. Dun dun dun. Just, just. Okay, so the upshot is we're going to be talking about kind of things we're doing. I warn you, there are questions that people probably have about a certain game called Cyberpunk 2077 that I am not going to be able to answer, and I'll tell you why. As I mentioned earlier, when we were all sitting around, the Poles are tall, quiet, dangerous men who will probably kill me. Uh, everybody jokes about that, and then I was talking to a friend of mine last night who actually specializes in mercenary work, and he said, oh yeah, the Polish guys, we don't mess with them. I said, you're a mercenary, so we still don't mess with them. <laughs> and he told a long involved story about not messing with Polish mercenaries and guys like that. So, under pain of death, and the, and the chance that you'll never get any more cyberpunk stuff ever again, I'm not going to tell you a bunch of things about cyberpunk 2077, but I will tell you what I can tell you. And I'll take questions along the way. Okay, so we have reactivated our Telsonian. This was not entirely planned. Uh, for some of you who can remember back in the dark, dark ages uh, when you were all small children. Smaller? Small children. Um, the industry crashed and burned at the tail end of the 90s into 2000s. This was a bummer because I was president of the trade association at the time, and so I felt like it was my fault. It wasn't, but what the heck. Um, it crashed because there were way, 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 way too many card games and not enough people buying them. So I blame all of you. Okay. The upshot is I then went back into video games and worked for a fairly long period of time at Microsoft, at Monolith, and a bunch of other studios and some freelance. Um, mainly because I had to go feed a growing child who was eating everything in the house. You know, they're like that. I couldn't just farm him out for him to work. So I came back in, and about the time I'd put in a couple of years teaching video game design over in a college in our area in Seattle, um, basically we got contacted by a guy out of nowhere uh, named Michal Novakowski. And Michal said, I represent this company called CDPR. I said, okay, so thank God he didn't say in Polish. I'd never understand it. And he said, we want to do cyberpunk. And I said... Okay, you're in Poland, right? Now, the running joke at Tal had been for a long time, we, we have licensed cyberpunk in nine languages. Polish was probably the last. And I remember when they showed up, and this group had said, yeah, we want to do cyberpunk, we want to have it translated into Polish. I said, well, that'll sell to six people. Yeah, what the hell. At least we can dine out on a fact. Yeah, we're Polish in Polish. Everybody else, oh, yeah, we had to sell for Chinese, too. But it turned out those six people worked at CDPR. <laughs> <laughs> or as one of them said to me, you know, back then when we were in college, we had communism and cyberpunk. And I said, thank you for choosing cyberpunk. <laughs> <laughs> so they were fans. And they called up and said, you know, we'd like you to come over. We're going to send you, you know, what we're doing currently so you can see it was legitimate. Well, my job at Microsoft was to go out and look at other studios and make sure they lived up to what we had to do with them as a publisher. So if somebody was like six years late, my job is to go and find out why they were six years late. You know, um, 
So I went over expecting to find, as I have actually found in studios that have come out of the Iron Curtain period at that time, a bunch of guys in a box-sized room, maybe the size of a large bathroom, uh, with computers on every surface and basically all crammed in this tiny sweat box, or as I would describe it, tell Sorian's offices now. Um, so basically, I get over there, and the week before they had sent me a copy of the game they had done. We have this smart thing we have done. We call it The Witcher 2. So I unbox Witcher 2, and I start looking, I go, Remember, I've been working in this business. I started in video games. Okay, way the hell back. So my jaw drops. I go, wow, this is really good. So I say, okay, right, it's a free flight to Poland, and it looks like they're not totally incompetent. So if they're all hiding in a big, you know, basement somewhere with a goat, they still do good stuff. So I went on out. Beautiful place. Incredibly talented team. And I'm walking around just going, well, I wish I had this one. I was at Microsoft. Dad, can I work for you guys? No, we want to do a license. So that is, in large part, how we ended up doing Cyberpunk 2077 with them. They were fans. We loved what they did. And the trade-off was that several years later, as we started this project, my son, uh, we were contacted by CDPR, and he said, do you know anybody who could do a uh, tabletop version of The Witcher, which by this time was Witcher 3? And... I'm going, well, I still don't do fantasy. I'm no good at it, really. And my son says, I want to do it. And I'm going, I got this 18-year-old standing there looking at me. And I'm going, you know enough about game design? He says, you're teaching it. I go to your classes. <laughs> so, you know, the, I, either I had to say then I'm a crappy teacher <laughs> or I had to go let it go ahead. So he turns around and I say, okay, I'll let you do it. You have to go pitch it. Okay, and I'm thinking, they're my friends. I'll let them out easy. I hope. At least don't hold it against me. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to do this. This is your baby. It's your project. You want to do it, right? So, we're out on the, the trip, uh, regular trip to Poland. Well, my family comes with me. Lisa usually does a lot of the business work with them. Uh, there is an amazing amount of legal work and business work that goes with doing a AAA title. It's terrifying. But on the other hand, we now have <sighs> trademarks and... Um, the ability to control who makes party hats for cyberpunk worldwide. Party hats. You laugh. I have now found black market party hats on eBay for <laughs> cyberpunk. <laughs> you got it. Well, and they weren't even like legally started yet. We just said party hats. Yeah, okay, right. Have the lawyers put that in. What the hell? Okay, so what happened was he came in, he made the pitch, and they liked it. So the next thing I go, I got this 18 year old, I'm going, you now have, the, you have the Witcher license. He's going, so you're going to help me? And I'm going, no. He, he does wish to have it known, Mike never told him how to write the pitch, so he wrote the book. He just wrote the book. <laughs> you know, I said, so, you know, he's in there and he's doing the pitch, like, Michal, and he's doing the pitch to then the head of marketing, then he's doing the pitch to... Uh, the next guy up the chain who was the studio design head. And then I come and he's doing a pitch finally to the president of the company, who is a real sharp dude. They're all sharp dudes. And I'm going, each time I walk through and I go, yeah, I'm throwing him out yet, okay. I, I'm surprised. I mean, I know he's good, but, you know, that's a father talking. No, he's good. <laughs> so at any rate, he just finished Witcher. And meanwhile, I've been doing a lot of cyberpunk stuff. Now, one of the side things that happened with this is that when CDPR approached me, they did not know, because they were hiding behind the Iron Curtain, trapped there, that I actually had worked in video games. At the time when they called me, I was working in video games. In fact, I was teaching video game design. So they got me in. They figured I'd be, you know, kind of this guy who had a license, and they'd, you know, do the game. And I knew it was going to be pretty solid to what we wanted to do because they were fans. They knew more about it than I knew sometimes. They'd go... So Johnny and Art, when this happened, did they get together? You know, I'm going, dude, I don't know. I never thought about that part, you know. So basically what happened was they went, oh, so we're going to do this, this, and this, and expecting me to push back. I'm going, well, yeah, well, what's your frame rate going to be, and how are you going to do this? And I started talking back to them about, you know, what you had to do. I had, like, two years earlier come off Matrix Online, so I had been dealing with a cyberpunk game. So basically, they went, oh, you can really help us. And I'm going, yeah, sure. So next thing I know, I'm flying back toward the Poland 
were calling each other like what six in the morning in my time and five in the evening at their time. And I'm like sitting there, you know, half awake, going, "Yeah, okay, so what was you wanted the story?" <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out that that collaboration thing worked really well, and we zeroed in closer and closer to a game that, you know, honestly looks like it's inside my head. So that was really, really cool. And when you look at what's out there on the screen for the 2077 trailer, that's what it's supposed to look like. And it wasn't as much a surprise for me because we've all been aiming towards that together. So, basically, I suddenly found myself with a game company that was restarting. My wife, who was bored out of her tree, said, because she'd been a business manager and she was now doing other things, she's going, I want to go back and do it. We miss hanging out with you guys. We miss going to the shows. We miss talking to the fans. We miss running games. You guys give us a heck of a lot of fun. And we hope we give you a lot of fun, too. So, this basically boiled down to my son finally coming in, he's now 18, he's already signed up for it. He's going, yeah, you know, I'm getting out of school, you know, I'm, I'm going to instead, um, let's restart the company. So, ganged up on by my family, by my old uh, business uh, guy, uh, actually my old, uh, what did you call it, Dave? Dave is my uh, production manager and uh, best friend as well. And they all ganged up on me and they said, okay, we're going to restart the company. So, I either joined or they started it over my dead body. <laughs> they would have done that. So basically we started refiring up Telsorian and a lot of the projects and ideas I would had have been beginning to generate come to fruition and one of the biggest ones besides obviously spending a lot of time in airplanes going to Warsaw, Poland, a place I never thought I'd ever go to in my life, but have since kind of gotten to feel like it's a second home. You know, I get to, out of the airport, I look around, you know, um, at Chopin Airport, and I go, oh yeah, uh, I think I'll go and, you know, pick up some of those pork sticks there, and I'm, I'm home. I've been going there obviously too long. But the upshot is, besides that, it was time to do new stuff with Cyberpunk. Part of it was the game's 30 years old. Uh, as somebody pointed out, the cell phones are the size of bricks in Cyberpunk. <laughs> But on the other hand, I did a revamp on it at one point, and the cell phones were down to like that big, and now this is what a cell phone looks like. So I wasn't that good at guessing on cell phones. Other things like, oh, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, stuff like that, I'm not bad at, but cell phones, I suck. <laughs> so basically, we started looking at it again. And as it happened, when the CDPR guys approached us, uh, I was working on a project called Cyberpunk Red. And Red actually did not have anything to do with CD Project Red. It was because the last book we had done was in green ink, and I was going to do this one in black and red ink again. So it was Cyberpunk Red as a code name. But it stuck, and the distributors liked it. And the CD Project guys thought, obviously, it, I must have liked gotten from what they read. So I was going to make them happy. Project Red is basically designed kind of as I call it, the Empire Strikes Back between the original Star Wars and 2077. It covers a lot of what happened after what was known as the Fourth Corporate War. How many people remember the Fourth Corporate War from their history books? You pass. <laughs> you sort of pass. You get a C. The rest of you <laughs> flunk out. I can say that I'm a college teacher. Fail! <laughs> okay, seriously. In Cyberpunk, we had a thing called the Fourth Corporate War, which was going to be the big event going on in the Cyberpunk universe. And we move our timeline in Cyberpunk forward about 10 to 20 years because we want to refresh things. We need to bring in new villains. We need to resolve conflicts and things like that. It's like an ongoing miniseries. So we had in 2013, 2020. This ended at 2027 with us blowing up the center of Night City with a small pocket nuke. So we decided, you know, we had to build on that somewhere. I mean, you have a pocket nuke, you gotta, where do you go from there, right? So I started asking the question of what would happen, one, if you dropped a pocket nuke in some place, other than being flowing radioactive, uh, how would society change? 
And one of the big things came about was that the corporate structure of nice city, of cyberpunk world, would be seriously disrupted. So instead of just totally monolithic corporations, everybody was blown back quite a bit. You know, and giants like Arasaka and Militech start slugging it out, and they take it to the level of armies in major cities around the world. This is World War IV. You know, I mean, literally, pocket nukes are the, the end. You know, it's Hiroshima at the tail end. So what happened? What did the world turn out like? Where did people go? Well, I knew it wasn't going to be total post-Holocaust, but I looked at how it would shift the world. It would mean that cyberpunks wouldn't be just totally fighting as monoliths anymore because all those corporations were gone. They had been nationalized, uh, things had crashed and burned, they had you know, lost all their troops. Or in other cases, those same corporations now were scrambling to get power back. So in Cyberpunk Red, for example, you guys can start a corporation and decide to go up against somebody if you want. It's a little bit bigger. You have, you know, and you may not succeed. You're going to be small. You know, you're going to be dipping dots as opposed to Baskin Robbins, but <laughs> you have that chance. Not all the corporations are evil, although, you know, obviously Cyberpunk, there's a lot of them that are evil because that's just the way it works. A lot of the technologies and capabilities have shifted because in the past you could go down to your local Militech dealer and you could buy, you know, a fairly decent, you know, heavy handgun or whatever, Militech, you know, each model year would come out. However, now Militech's been knocked back down to where it's now an adjunct of the United States government. Arasaka has been banished from the U.S. mostly. Um, so stuff that you take for granted is not always available. And it also means that people are making new stuff. So you go out on the market and you're not going to a weapons showroom anymore. You're going to a local weapons dealer who happened to have picked up two loads of Militech stuff, some Arasaka, and a bunch of other things from five or six other manufacturers that you know just pop up and do really good work. But there's not a lot of known quantities about it. Some of it's phenomenal, you know. Some of it is crap. Some of it, you guys may be actually running the weapons corporations that make it. So that's what ShakeUp does. So Red, which we're planning to have for Christmas or the quarter after Christmas, kind of depends on the schedule. Uh, Red is basically an interregnum. It is what happens after you have World War III, as it were, a corporate war, wreck everything, and then people scramble for the best opportunities, the best stuff, uh, survival, so forth. If you were nomad before, you know, and you were just, you know, traveling the back roads, that was one thing. Now you're the major communication and transit for the reunited United States, what's left of it. You have people who were living in Night City, they can't live there anymore because if they do the glow in the dark. And so they need to move somewhere. So suddenly towns out in the middle know that had been abandoned during the drought, during the rock hit during you know, the flooding and all that, some of them are coming back and you're moving out to these places and you have no idea what's out there. It's been abandoned for 20 years, like Detroit. So, <laughs> Detroit, I love Detroit. I went to Detroit a couple of years ago and I'm going down downtown, it's five o'clock and many of the buildings, these big office buildings are boarded up to like the fifth floor. It's dead silent. There's occasional cars going by so this is just so silent. I love this place, <laughs> you know. I, 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 you know, I told Kevin Zimbiana, you're kind of lucky you live in Detroit. You know, it's cool. <laughs> so at any rate, um, the upshot is things are more up for grabs. People are on the move. You can discover weapons. You can discover gear. You can discover hidden technologies. One of the mo most interesting things I'm very proud of is a thing called the data crash. Um, the world we live in is built on information but it's built on the idea that the information is reliable and findable. That's why we have Google, okay? But what if somebody built a program and had methodically been transferring and preparing data to be rewritten to other files and other places and erased into core files? So 
you're there at Arasaka and you have a brand new howitzer that you've just designed and the data crash comes along and you go in to get your howitzer file and you find there's a recipe for cookies and you're diabetic. <laughs> and you're also the weapons manufacturer designer for Arasaka. And uh, somewhere over in Des Moines, a housewife opens up her recipe book and says, what's a howitzer? <laughs> the data crash was, I, I worked this out with a couple friends of mine who were programmers over at MS, Microsoft. And we basically figured out how you could build a program that if it, instead of going through and um, stealing information or leaving viruses, the virus basically flagged things and then moved them around. Kind of in a modified version of tags. So, Rish Bartmoss, the ace all time crazy programmer of the Cyberpunk universe, built this, stayed in the net when the net was being reformatted into the new format that we used all through 2020, and buried a lot of backdoors. So he was coding right behind Ihara and Grubb. And as a result, he set a dead man, and when he died in his refrigerator, he was hiding out. Uh, it's a long story. <laughs> But at any rate, when he died, the dead man switch went off and information very, very quietly started getting moved from one place to the other. Uh, he's not technically moving. It's like, I had a copy. It was supposed to show up here. So it went somewhere else. And then I erased the original. The other thing is Arasaka figured out about halfway through what was going on while Netwatch was going insane trying to figure out what was going on. And they said, whoa, we have a secure database. It's always been secure. We have always had it separate of the net. So we have the only true information repositories. They, they created a thing called the reliquary, which essentially had all the data. So I'm looking at that, and I'm talking to Dave Ackerman about it at one point. And Dave says, well, yeah, but they're books, Mike. And I'm going, well, in the future, yeah, they're books. But I'm a li I was a librarian, and I worked in various libraries, ranging from technical to um, collections and things like that. And I said, you do realize that all the books we have printed now are designed on in papers, as free papers, so they will not rot. Because otherwise, if you have a huge library, books like I have, you know, you come in, you open up your, your treasured copy of the foundation, it goes, Shh, unless you got the right paper. Okay? So Arasaka built a virus that did the same thing to non-acid papers and spread it throughout agents, went through, hit libraries, hit bookstores, and so forth, in a world where there wasn't a lot. It's like, you know, I have about 800 books in this thing right now, okay? I have, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of regular books, but I don't really have these mostly in paper anymore because it's inconvenient to carry 800 books in your pocket. Most of you probably do the same thing. Right. So consequently, Arasaka basically planted another virus to destroy all the paper books and backgrounds and other things so they would possess the major information resource in the new order after the fourth corporate war was done. And, you know, it's funny because I've had people, you know, in the other parts of the team going, but that's not possible. I'm going, hey, you go talk to the guys over here who are programmers. You're not a programmer. Get out of here. Um, and, you know, well, what about the paper? That's... I was reference and antiquities librarian. I know what I'm talking about. I know how to wreck paper. It's probably what I do. I call it writing. Um, so the upshot is basically by the end of the fourth corporate war, information was really up for grabs, which means it's available to you. And power in the cyberpunk world is about information. That's why you do this. You know, if you know how to make a gun, and you have 3D forming, you can make a gun. It may look pretty funky, but you can make a gun. But in a cyberpunk world where we've already been making guns using this type of 3D CAD CAM, all you need to do is have the core files for the latest Arasaka before they went under, and you can make a billion copies of that thing. So information, data, free for all. So, Red is interesting because it's part treasure hunt now. It's part trading information. If you're a net runner now, you don't have the net you used to have. You have to go into places, hack into, and physically go to the computers, pull things out.
but if you find something really good that shouldn't have been there, it's really valuable. So you, you find yourself sitting there in the middle of, you know, some Des Moines Housewives recipe file pulling out the new Arasaka tank. So you also have open space in terms of movement. Nowadays, you know, in the new uh, setup for Red, you may be going out there to where that housewife in Des Moines is because you're now resettling Iowa. So to get there, you need nomads, you need solar protect groups, you need people who can keep those ad infrastructure up, you have people who are going to rebuild, so techies have work, corporations have work, cops who are now called lawmen because they're no longer necessarily just in the cities, they have work. Who's patrolling those, those highways? You know, Mad Max is patrolling those highways and he has a badge. So this is what's happening with RED. And I've been working on it for about five years now. I started before we actually started doing City Project RED concept. And it is basically designed to bring things forward quite a bit so that I can explain why cell phones are no longer the size of bricks. Now, you know, we're not going to basically just do that and then go home, even though we do have a lot of projects. Uh, we're already beginning to secure and bring writers in on that. And uh, if you guys start following our new media channels, which she's involved in, and our media ambassador, uh, Jay Gray, who has been doing a phenomenal job. These two guys, that's why I'm getting recorded now. Yes, it For is. For some reason, they decide this is a good idea. Um, if you're not here in this room, or, I mean, or know somebody who is, you can go, Hey, did you know our Telsarian Games has a Facebook page? They're actually active on it? They interact with their crowd? What? Yeah, they're that, not that's a, a lot new of thing? us. They're not a lot of us. You know, on, on, at full staff, Telsarian had about 10 to 12 people, and then we had about another 50 around the world that did stuff with us. We're down to about six or seven now. And we're staffing up, but you know, we weren't planning to. We downsized stuff in 2000 when I went into computer games. So we're having to rebuild things, and it means you know, at the time I'm typing furiously to get something out, and somebody comes in and goes, did you look at the Facebook page? I'm going, the what? <laughs> get out of here. I'm trying to finish. You know, you know, hiss, yeah. hiss. Why do we need to interact with fans? Uh, yeah. I like you guys. Why don't you send me a note later? <laughs> you know? And that's not because we don't like to communicate, but we just, flat, frankly, until we had Jay. This new age concept. I knew about this, <laughs> young whippersnapper. <laughs> Um, Punks these days. You millennials, you think you invented the internet. It probably helps that I'm married to Cody Pondsmith, so I have family Don't access brag. to bug them about things that I go, hey. Family this dinners are all pain now. She, Did you get that in? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody wants to know. They Facebook messaged me, Dad. Yeah, well, that's why you got hired to do that. Tell me about it later. But yeah. seriously, we, we have wanted to communicate a lot more. We just up to now haven't had the bandwidth and we haven't had dedicated people to do it. We had hired a college student who was doing it for a while part-time. We discovered he wasn't doing much of it part-time. We didn't have enough time to even check on it. <laughs> you know, it was that ridiculous. But like I said, when you're flying around the, the planet going places and you're trying to make deadlines, it gets pretty chaotic. But what we want to do is do a lot more support and let you guys in on you know chunks of the process as it goes along. We also now have the bandwidth to begin to bring our writers on team so that we can get new stuff done much, much faster. So we're already planning the subsequent books and bringing on staff to do the new books that will be coming out with Cyberpunk Red, as well as all the other stuff. We're also working, because I have a new art director, um, we will be not just doing stuff for Red, but Red's stuff will be in color. So it's going to be color book. Uh, it'll be hardbound for change, because now hardbound is you know, not as, it used to be when Hardbound came out, it was like, this is the luxury product. <laughs> you have a binding. You know, oh, binding, this must be real. Is this a library? <laughs> yes, and it's rotting because of the Arasaka virus. Shut up. <laughs> but yeah, what's, what's happening is we now are able to both increase and improve the quality and do new stuff and bring new people in to track on stuff. So, it's going to be really interesting and exciting. And one of the things I'm looking forward to is we get to expand that world and add more depth and let the players be more involved in it. Because 
before you were just edge runners on the street, you had a role, but now you get to pick and make some of the moral decisions. If I knock off this corporation, who or what replaces it? What's my role in it? If I suddenly open up a file as a net runner and I find a bio plague that can kill several million people, do I sell it? Do I use it? Do I hide it? If I am roaming the outer, you know, areas of northern Canada and I come upon a enfilade of tanks that were left over from the war and it depends there's all work, hmm, do I start a booster gang? Do I do protection? Do I, you know, back up people who are trying to move back to Saskatchewan? I've got a bunch of tanks. Your chances of having tanks before were zip. Now you got tanks. <laughs> but you don't have a lot. And you also don't have gas. So now there's going to be a lot more cross-breeding, cross-pollination between groups. One of the things I'm really looking forward to is building up the social media. I'd like to start seeing people within that trading information between their cyberpunk groups as though it's a living world, which is one reason why we have the living campaign stuff going for cyberpunk right now. It's very much prototype for the idea of a world that keeps moving, things happen, you guys can participate, jump on the train or jump off the train as you want. So that's a lot of what we're doing for Cyberpunk, and I'm going to open up for questions, and she's going to moderate because she's nasty and bites. Hands up really high. I already see the first one there. Oh, by the way, she's a school teacher, so you know, like, she will make you stand the corner. <laughs> so I see the first hand over here, so I'll start there. Shoot your hand up while he's talking, and if I see you, I'll spot you and put you guys in order in my head. Okay. Hey, she'll put you in order, man. <laughs> <laughs> Do not mess with her. So first question, second, third. One word, Cybergen. What happened to that? Uh, Cybergen was a close story. Believe it or not, Cybergen actually happens in 2020. And it was folded. It didn't happen as big. I wrote Cybergen, and I set it up for 2020. And then I'm sitting there one night, and I'm going, I wonder what it would be like if the whole world was like that. So uh, actually, Cybergen, part of that story will partially surface in red. But it will not be you know, the sweeping thing. Personally, I've always wanted to do Cybergen as a, you, know, you know one of those uh, teen movies. I think it'd be kind of like X Men with cyberware, tormented kids, you know, badass, bad adults, and Morgan Blackhand in there as that strong father figure that <laughs> shoots you when you screw up. But <laughs> well, Dad, shut up, or I'll kill you. Number two. Okay, so uh, the original Cyberpunk was very much. Yeah. Uh, so for like several and I was right. Look around you, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like several months red or even 2077, are you going to do the same thing? Are you going to stick with like the 1980s feature? Yeah, we're pretty better? much going to keep with a lot of the 80s. And the reason is, we, as we discovered with V3, you guys don't want transhumanism. Uh, Dave Ackerman beat me up and said, you really should have not called it Cyberpunk V3. He said, it's really great if they weren't expecting Cyberpunk. But... What we have learned, and we really learned this by the time we got to 2077, is people like the 80s in hindsight. <laughs> you know, it's like nowadays you can look at it and go, yeah, all that violet and all that you know, Miami Vice-like stuff was cool because right? I don't have to live it, and Cindy Lauper is not like you know, on the charts all the time. So basically, we are going to keep some of that stack. Another reason is it has become a really solid part of how cyberpunk is depicted within a genre, and also within an overall aesthetic. And I, I've been amazed, you know, I, I listen to, you know, uh, outrun type musics and, you know, various synth music and all that, I always do that. And suddenly I'm going, look, there's synth channels all over YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm to see oh. Bitcoin and Twitter. <laughs> you, you may see equivalents of that. We don't mirror, we try not to exactly mirror what actually went down. If you notice, there's a lot of stuff happening in our cyberpunk 80s that wasn't going to be there in the 80s. It didn't stick around. What my job is in many ways is to extrapolate where culture will go and find out whether it will be believable if I draw that story around it. So, next. Three. Uh, so By the way, she has really perfect hair for cyberpunk. <laughs> <laughs> A little blue. 
<laughs> and there you are. So when you stopped by your booth before, you, you basically had mentioned that you know, before you had classes, you had your solo, you had your, your roles that they were doing. Uh, before the, the book. And so in red, are you considering uh, moving away for like you mentioned, might be done in the game? Is this going to be you have a solo, you have uh, your med technique? Have stats, right? uh, you're going to have, um, and this, this ties to some stuff I've been doing in the last year or so, it is more fluid. You can now shift classes and blend a bit more. We're looking at much closer to you know certain skill tree combinations and things like that. And the reason is that we did the classes, frankly, as training wheels. When we wrote Cyberpunk, nobody knew anything about this. I mean, remember, Gibson is just coming out. Nobody knows about this genre. So a lot of, I, I laugh now because a lot of things we have as terms of, you know, Cyberpunk art are now, you know, in books as, yes, and this is, you know, a Netrunner. Okay, I made that up. I just had to come up with a name for it. Now it's like what you call a guy who does this, you know. So the whole idea of what we did with the roles was to give everybody training wheels to know what you would do as a thing in this world. How will I be a guy who's basically a fighter? How will I be a guy who's basically kind of the mage? How will I be the cleric? How will I be, you know, the lord or, you know, power broker? So that is why the roles are there. And the roles have their special abilities to help you focus on where is the axis point where my effect in the world will most likely happen. Okay, so as a solo, I know that I deal in well-trained, competent violence. I am there to hurt and protect and destroy or whatever. So for me, combat sense is a very important thing. I need to know and strategically say, when do I apply violence? When do I do these things? But it's been 30 years. By now, people have the joke they know how to do it. They know how a cyberpunk world generally works. You know, like I said, I'm a, really amused a lot of times to see stuff that I was like, you know, spitballing and throwing out there, and it's now shows up in a book somewhere. And I go, hmm, that's really kind of interesting. I'm kind of flattered, and I think I should sue the guy for money. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, blew it again. But now, because people know that, we can now loosen those up, and your job isn't a hard and fast job. You may be a rocker for a while. You may be elements of a solo who also packs along, you know, elements of being a nomad. So a couple things are changed. For example, the role that we used to call cops is now lawmen. Because what you effectively do in this iteration is you basically are authorized to have legal power to detain and arrest. And in certain cases, take stuff. So as a lawman, your, your ambit basically is much, much wider than I'm a cop on a beat. So those things are reflected. But, you know, I know people, friends of mine who were cops, and they went off and did other things. They didn't die when they stopped being cops. Luckily, they made it to be able to not have to be cops in one piece. So the same thing should happen with your characters. Your characters should be able to be a little more fluid, and we can do that now. Because as players, you've matured to learn about how a world like Cyberpunk works. And we have a lot more slack because we don't have to put training wheels on everything. And the people who are having problems figuring out how that works or what the world is like, they have a million examples now out there. There are Cyberpunk movies and books and concepts all over the place, which means they're going to want to do things that aren't necessarily down the same lines that I set up 30 years ago. Cool? Uh, number four is back there. Please make sure to speak loudly so the camera can pick you up. Uh, they're around. <laughs> That's all I'm going to tell you. <laughs> but I will tell you this, Adam Smasher is not around. <laughs> I was kind of wondering about the scope of the world. You know America, and now you know a bit more about Poland. I was wondering if, if I imagine there will be many books and that will eventually expand. But uh, being European, I'm kind of curious how big the initial scope will feel. 
Will it, be, will it start almost homing in America, the North American continent, expanding out from that? We, we, ha we have to home in America at this point because the linchpin of most cyberpunk is either Japan or America. We started pushing out a bunch of that to China, and that's because I've been there and I have friends over there now, so there's a bit more of that. Europe is a very complex situation because it's not like you know people in America often think, oh, you come from Europe, you must know my friend over here in Poland, you know, and you're like British. <laughs> Actually, in British, you may know my friend in Poland, something, but you know, you're. I, I have German friends who like, oh yeah, they, they say, hey, I know a guy over in Germany, you probably know him. <laughs> Guys, really? <laughs> so Europe is more complex because it is many, many cult cultures and many, many ways of dealing with the same problems. So what we usually do in those cases, we're going to start with the U.S. because although it is many, many microcultures, there's still a pretty standard, it's America. Then we move over to Europe, and one of the reasons we do that around the world is every book we've done in the series of stuff around the world, we use writers who live there. They are on site. They are, you know, I mean, when one reason we know the Bulls, you know, we, we got guys over there who, you know, did this work. And that's always been a hallmark. Many, many years ago, I remember uh, being amused at the fact that in Shadowrun, they were talking about car chases. And, and then I know that Jordan or Robert Fassett knows what Seattle is like, but many of the writers didn't. Seattle is freaking vertical. Yeah, I mean, literally, you come down some, uh, off the top of the hill, and you're like, you're going over, it's like, <laughs> it makes San Francisco look flat in places. And, you know, so... I'm always laughing at the idea, like, and then I came down in a poke and I dropped into, you know, Kearney and I did, and it was like, <laughs> splash into the sound, <laughs> you know. And that's why you get people who are local, because they tell you, no, you can't have a car chase like that. And then you go, okay, well, how would a car chase work? I need to figure this out. This will be kind of cool. But the people who live there know it. So... For example, we did the uh, Far East book. Everybody who wrote in there lived in those countries, and they knew it. And actually, it was a couple, when we did Australia in that part, I remember it was kind of funny, because I went there and kind of checked on the guys who were writing, you know, because I'm walking around Melbourne going, hmm, okay, yeah, this could happen, okay, you pass. So that's what we're going to do, is going to have to tackle parts of the world differently over time and find writers now who are there. That way is right. Who's next? Do you know your friend's question while he's out of the room? <laughs> okay, we'll come back to Fail. him. Uh, any questions? Second question. Uh, this, one's so this guy's good. hogging all the action, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you better start thinking. I'm grading. Sorry, but I wanted to ask about the green stripe. The green stripe. Wow, someone's interested in the green stripe. I am always amazed that people have any interest in what the hell I wear. You know, I see. <laughs> what is there not to be interested in? It's green stripe. I mean, okay, young, cool. she's got all purple. I think that is awesome. Okay, uh, the, okay, this goes back when I was in. I was in college. I was a drama guy as well, and we had spray in hair. And I put a green stripe in one day for the hell of it, and I liked it. And I kept it. And I would spray it in every so often. This is before you could go by Manic Panic. So then, you know, I did it. I stopped doing it for a while because you could get the stuff. And I kind of missed it. And when I went to work for Microsoft, surprisingly enough, it was very boring. Kind of, I would walk in in metal t-shirts and things like that and blue jeans. And all these guys were wearing button-down shirts and dockers. And I'm like, we're in the game design development, guys. In development. We do development here. What? What are you doing wearing dockers? They're going, we always wore dockers. So I stopped with a piercing in my ear that I had. I used to have a Jedi Q down one side with a braid. And actually, I had two by the end of it. And I let all that slide. I stopped wearing death metal t-shirts as much. And I basically kind of got normal. Besides, I didn't want to embarrass my son. He was a teenager. They embarrass easy. Which, if you come back and I had an earring and green in my hair, you'd gone, Cody, what's wrong with your dad? No, I, I would have been cool. My parents would have gone, who's this guy? 
I don't care about your parents. <laughs> <laughs> They're not my parents. No, actually, actually uh, I'm quite fond of her father, and we go out and drink and have a good time in bars, and we're not going to tell you what happens. <laughs> and we never told you either. I, I, I'm not sure I want to know at this you point. Don't. You don't. Know, your dad knows an amazing number of bars. So. <laughs> yes, he does. Yeah. Uh, so the green strike only recently came back. The green strike recently came back. Uh, I decided I missed it, and I'd already put the earring back in. I, I wasn't going to grow the queue in. I, I thought Jedi is not cool anymore. <laughs> so, and besides, it was it was a real pain because I had to go down and go to a hair weave place to get one put in because I wasn't growing it long anymore. Although I have been tempted to put dreads in recently, but that's another story. And I said I'm put the green stripe back in. So I started spraying the green stripe in, and eventually I went, yeah, this isn't working because I, you know, it drips it goes bad. So I talked to my lovely daughter-in-law, who does everybody's hair in the family. Really? I, I the, the adoptive sister, uh, my family I've done for a while, I do my hair. Does my best friend's hairs, you know, I mean, basically, she's the <laughs> hair mistress, as well as the... Uh, it came about accidentally. So basically, she helped me put the first one in, and now I'm down to where I can do it myself, so that's why I have a green stripe. It, I call it my flash, and it's something I did way the hell when I started designing. So, you know, it's a personal thing. Along with, I have like... No. This cyberpunk is green. <laughs> Our friend came back. Did I see a hand over here for after? Okay. Okay, so... And then, was that a hand? No. Okay. <laughs> One, then two. So, I thought the original cyberpunk was a stark contrast to a vision of the future portrayed in, like, Star Trek with an optimistic vision of the future... Cyberpunk is more of a realistic, more pessimistic viewer version than a realistic version of the future, uh, one could say. Yeah. Uh, with the Cyberpunk Red uh, being almost post-apocalyptic, does that reflect your own more pessimistic version? Of the <laughs> Remember my son saying, think happy thoughts, Dad. <laughs> okay. Um, Basically, the post-apocalyptic side had already happened with the collapse before the 2013 universe that you guys all walked into. What I wanted to show was actually more than just Night City and how people change, how they deal with change. You know, not, not to get preachy, um, my specialty, my hobby is paleontology. So, and in my specialty in that area, besides large Mosasaur-like things with enormous teeth that could eat everybody in this room and burp, uh, is actually extinction theory. So I study why ec ecosystems go to hell. And we have a really great opportunity, and I put all of those to work destroying the United States in 2030, or 2013 rather, because I needed to have a world that was messed up as badly as we could so we would, ha would have road gangs running around, so we would have people crammed into cities, so we would have disaster happening everywhere. Um, I look upon cyberpunk, as I think most of the writers who write cyberpunk do, as warning. It's, you know, I don't think any of us get up in the morning and go, I really want to fight my way through the booster gang to get coffee. <laughs> you know. Um, you know, my little dog with spikes all over him now, you know. Pikachu, kill! <laughs> <laughs> Corgi, I like the idea of a corgi with big metal teeth. Yeah. <laughs> Coming in low. <laughs> but, you know, we, we want to warn people of what happens if you take it for granted or you give certain people too much power and you don't look out for yourself and you don't take it personally. When you go, yeah, I don't think I'll vote because what does it matter? It matters because you hand power to people and they may not be the people you like. Politics aside, you hold power, you hold capability, because that is what allows you to determine your own damn future. Hand it to someone else, you get a cyberpunk future. Don't do that, guys, because it's for real. So that is the warning that goes with cyberpunk, is you want to have this future, you work for it. If you want to have a somewhat better future, you better get off your butt and work for it, because it's going to get there anyway. So, yeah, it is uh, not... See, the problem with old science fiction, I'm a big fan of it, is that it always posits that there's going to be fairly enlightened people who want things to come out right. And so when they invent a big computer 
they're going to use it to help mankind instead of, I'm going to track all of you bastards and I'm going to have files on you and I can make you do anything I want. Well, history shows us that there's more often that guy than a guy who says, hey, let me help all of you. It's a rarity. So what cyberpunk does is says that technology, power, can be put together and be a very, very terrifying force but also, you can grab your own power through technology, knowledge, and banding together. Yeah, one and two. Enough, enough of the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, of the no. <laughs> hey, he asked. <laughs> you didn't ask me about coffee shops in Cyberpunk, no. <laughs> so I've been asking this for, for, for years and years. Edge of Swords 2, Edge of Swords 2, the uh, Okay. Um, the problem with Edge of the Sword is, yeah, Kevin Doherty did uh, initially a book many, many, many years ago that was very inspirational for us at Calsorian because he listed every damn weapon that had existed since the Stone Age except rocks. And we used it as reference. When we write things at Tal, we pretty well know how they work. You know, it, I, I love it. I'm, I can't wait for the first person who comes up and says to my son at Witcher, you know, I, Long swords don't work that way. And my son swings his long sword off his shoulder and shows him what you can do with it. Likewise, you know, I was actually in a murder trial one point where I ended up refuting one of the uh, prosecuting guys because I pointed out that the ejection ports on that particular automatic weapon didn't fire that way and that the brass would be in the car. Okay. No, dude, doesn't work that way. But you don't know. Here, let me pull this up. I'll show you on the stand. <laughs> so basically, knowledge is what we use. And it means that the things we develop are driven by that knowledge and that interest. And we like finding out about it. You know, nobody had to convince my son to learn how to use a katana. Nobody had to convince me that I had to go out and buy large black guns so I could find out how they fired when they fired and how much of a kick they have on your shoulder. <laughs> you know, these are things we, we want to do so that the products we do are good and they're solid. Mm -hmm. We got one, then two. So my first question would be, Cyberpunk Red is ending <coughs> 2030 or a little before? Uh, it begins at 2030 and it's moving into the 40s. We might go as high as the 50s. That's right. <laughs> At this point, we don't say anything because what happens is if I say the sky will be blue, a whole lot of people will show up in the press writing clickbait titles like Mike Posmus says a green sky isn't good enough. <laughs> I get up in the, well, we get up in the morning and we have a morning meeting and we go through all the posts, you know, and uh, Jay posts things and we look at them and we go, What? I did not say that. <laughs> yeah. But to get back on track, since we've got 10 minutes, we've got two more questions after this one. Okay. And then, so just, um, do you mean to leave that as like a nebulous area? Until we do a 2077 supplement. That happens after 77 comes okay. out. You don't get any clues before then. Just, and then, just a really fast second question. Where do we get to 2077 merch? When will that happen? Later. Yeah, talk. <laughs> Absolutely no promises on dates. No promises. And then in the back. So I guess, uh, just a really quick question. Um, what's, what's your most inspirational or work? That's a hard question, it probably is. What's, what's one of your top five most inspirational uh, cyberpunk type uh, media, be it uh, TV or video game or book? So like I said, my, my first and foremost was Blade Runner. Okay. I own all the versions of Blade Runner. I, I watch Blade Runner about once a month, and I go, oh, well, what did he come up with that? Uh, one of the better write, writers on there, one of the best writers on there, but in a specific style, is William Gibson. Um, I also love other formats of it, uh, Ghost in the Shell, for example. Um, the thing about it is there's been an argument in the press about, you know, cyberpunk, and what is really cyberpunk? All of it. I mean, seriously, there's a lot of, it's like saying, what is a cowboy novel? There's a lot of ways to do a cowboy novel, you know. So I appreciate all of them. Those are the ones I particularly like the most. Cool. Last question, I think, will probably be this one. 
So I know that you. This better be good. So I know that you focus on America. Right now, I do, yeah. Will you ever expand possibly in Japan and with other corporations? Yeah, I answered part of that with his previous question. One of the things that drives, it's important. One of the things that drives what we do in other countries is having writers in those other countries. You know, if we can't get somebody who intimately knows it, I can write a lot about Poland now, but I cannot write anything as well as my partners over at CDPR. So if I'm going to have someone write about Poland, I'm getting somebody who lives in Warsaw. And then I'm going to get somebody in Poznan, too. So that's why we're not expanding beyond the United States right now until we get the writing teams together. But, you know, we're all going to live at least another couple of years, right? I hope. So that means we'll have a chance to get to the rest of Europe. So I'm going to have him say goodbye to the camera because we're going to say... Goodbye, camera. <laughs> and then there, uh, if you wish to approach him afterwards, don't flood him. He's the only one of them. I can't duplicate him. Um, but we've got business cards for those who want it. You can also locate us on Facebook. We actually have presence there now, Our Telsarian Games. Please locate us on there. And if you can't stay and talk, have a great Gen Con. And if they run you out, fight for it. <laughs> okay.